Right, so I shall have like fluid. We're back in finite space. It should have been last week's episode, unfortunately. I wasn't feeling well, had a sore throat, and I just could not record and sound like I normally do. So I decided to uh, take a week off and allow my voice time to recover. So here we are. It's this week. We're back to see what's going on with Corwin and Calbex and the rest of them. And uh, recently, as in a few weeks ago, when Finance Space had a new update, so we're up to uh, build four. We won't be seeing that in this episode, but uh, I'm hoping to get to it before too long. I'll talk a bit about that towards the end of the video. Anyway, let's get back into the story. It starts as it always does, with a rumble above the clouds. Roiling grey, angry and menacing. The unending flashes are green are akin to lightning, though the sounds are far more terrifying. The green storm. The plague is attacking. The discharge from their ships turns the clouds to sickly green. A storm forms above. It is horrifying. I'm scared. So scared. The silence is palpable. All faces upturned with fear and terror. Waiting. Hoping it will pass if only no one speaks. Ah! A baby cries. A singular anguish cry. All hell breaks loose. Screams echo throughout the town. People run. It becomes a full-blown panic. Having missed a sea of legs, clutching tight to mother's hand. She's leading me away, telling me to hurry. But I'm slow, confused. I lose her hand. So simple in the moment, so easily. She's gone. I'm alone in the crowd. I cry, adding my voice to the chorus around me. I spin as I try to find her or catch a glimpse of her kind eyes. I hear her calling for me, even through the wall of other noises. I hear her calling my name. Corwin! Corwin! Where are you, baby? Corwin! I'm pushed aside, into an alley. People thunder past. The green flashing and booms of explosions overhead punctuate every heartbeat. Corwin! Has anyone seen my child? Then it happens. The first jet black spear rips through the cloud line. A plague ship hurtles down towards the town. Screams intensify. Corwin! I surge upright in bed, pulling harsh lungfuls of air into my heaving chest. I'm drenched in sweat. I throw myself out of bed and then stagger to the basin. The water spirals in a whirlpool down the drains. I splash my face repeatedly, drinking some handfuls shakily once finished. I look into the mirror over the basin. My eyes are wild and my hair is a mess. I concentrate on my image as I start to force my breathing back to normal. It takes a while. I stare at myself in the mirror. My reflection is haggard and sticky. He shares my panicked and terrified expression. This shared feeling helps me calm down. And he does too. It's a technique I developed. A stupid ritual. It works on nights like this. A dream again. Wretched and so clear. A word still ringing my ears. It has been a while since my last nightmare. The mood must have shook it up to the surface. I slowly regain control of my breath, even as my heart still pounds in its flight or flight mode. Squeezing my eyes closed and splashing more water helps. The cold slows me down. As I feel more myself, I swipe the mirror to status mode. I dry my face with a hand towel. The time is well before dawn. I don't think I can sleep again after the ordeal, though. I feel grim. I slide open the door, thankful for how silent it is. I cock my ear in the direction of the corridor that leads to my night's room. He's either a silent sleeper or these rooms are far more insulated than I thought. Taking my chance, I walk softly down the corridor to where the bathroom is. 
Once inside, I'd take it all in fresh. I hadn't really inspected it before and just passed out after the late meal. It's large and definitely looks fitting for a high-ranking knight. A sink and toilet are on the left side of the room. On the other, a sunken bath sits like a small pool. A sleek-looking high-tech cylinder reflects in the mirrors, dominating the centre of the room. White braces split the glass chamber into four parts, rising to meet a white ring at the top. It has far more nozzles and knobs than any I've seen before. I'm both curious and mildly fearful of it. Each wall seems to be a visual monitor, though only the left side next to the toilet is active. It displays a forest that seems to stretch far out of sight. As I pass by, the parallax effect kicks in, and additional hollow images extend to give the sense of entering the woods. I imagine it to be both comforting and grants a sense of modesty, but it currently reminds me too much of my dream. I look away to instead focus on the challenge before me, the shower. The glass slides apart as I approach, and I step inside, which causes the door to close with a soft sound. As the shower hums to life, the nozzles above jostle and pivot as if waking up, and the floor beneath me warms pleasantly. The halo ring from above descends just above my head in eager anticipation. The panel shows that the shower can run automatically, but also can be operated manually if needs be. I wonder, did he get this installed during his rehab phase to eliminate the need for anyone to help him clean himself? Calbex is proud and hates looking weak, I'm starting to understand. I guess that the daydreams of getting to tend to my night will remain fantasies. Selecting the automatic function on the shower, I hear the machine start up. The nozzles on the sides descend to ankle level with a whir and start shooting hot water. They ascend and rotate around me till I'm thoroughly drenched. The apparatus continues rising upward over my head as I realise I'd not entered myself as a new user and the machine was operated on Calbex's configuration. With a wet fumble, I turn off the rinse cycle and switch to manual. Having full control now, I manoeuvre the nozzles and adjust the temperature until the deluge is just right and I can enjoy the process much more. One of the nozzles dispenses a scented oily gel that has faint grassy notes, and soon the entire chamber smells like a meadow. I can pick out a few additional scents, pine, citrus, as well as some sweet and floral notes. Either way, it smells lovely, and I waste no time rubbing it into my scalp. It does not lather much, but it does feel very indulgent to wash the long day and the night sweat away without a time limit. I spend a good deal longer under the spray than I originally intended, but thankfully I feel much calmer by the end of it. Playing with the panel, I figure out the fan above is an included blow dryer. As I start it up, part of the shower floor opens to suck the water and moisture out through vents. I think it must be for fur. I know many races do shed a fair bit, so this must be the best way to clean it up. And dried very quickly. It's not as comforting as the shower, though. I think I may bring my towels next time and do it the old-fashioned way. But I'm clean, dry, and most definitely awake now. Returning to my room, I dress in expected squire attire. The tight fit of material clings to the body and leaves little to the imagination, but it's comfortable at least. When we enter battle, you'll wear this garment underneath our armour as a conduit between machinery and flesh. While cybernetics like Calvex's eyes certainly do have some perks, most species use suits like these to interface with tech rather than directly augmenting them to their bodies. The advancement of smart mesh clothing was a fairly big leap in military might. By decreasing the light to give haptic feedback almost instantaneously, it allows for far greater mobility and manoeuvring. The Aegis is also able to work at high sensitivity. I shiver in part anticipation, part excitement and part trepidation. It won't be long now till I can make a difference. Speaking of duties, there is one I should get to. I realise the time is now when I originally intended to wake up. Creeping back out and down the stairs, I am now certain the rooms must be soundproofed. I am still not about to disturb my night without good cause. Entering the kitchen, I swipe the lights on and survey my kingdom. Time to make my night's breakfast. I probably should have asked Calbex what he usually eats, but he likely would have declined my offer. I start by opening the various panels, revealing a pretty good selection of grains, produce and meats. Seeing a large selection of carefully diced and packaged meats made me think I should look up a few lupine recipes for some evening meals Calbex couldn't refuse. I find some oats, 
the package being less than half full makes me think it's a safe bet. The cooking unit is more advanced than any of the ones I've ever used before. At a place in a pan on it, the stove material rises and moles around it snugly to hold it in place. The material registers what's placed on it, with a bit of trial and error I get the pot simmering away. In my cabinet raid I found a pulpy yellow fruit. After slicing it I find it has a mildly sweet taste that I think will go nicely as a topping. It might not be elite, but it will at least fill the quota for calories and nutrients. As I spoon the mixture into a larger bowl, I feel somewhat confident that it should be enjoyable. I glance at my stick for the time, and although I'm still early, I do want to find the mess hall. That's where the other squires and I will normally dine for breakfast. I pick up the bowl as well as the metal canister that was on the counter and seems to have been prepared the night before. Where should I place it so you'll find it? Maybe I should take it to his room? Well, that might be a step too far. I might be overstepping right now by invading his space like this. Ask him after he gets hooked on Corwin's fancy feasts. I decide to leave the spread on the table while we ate last night. After I set it down, I place a cloche over the bowl to keep the heat in and set the canister beside it. Presentation perfect. Satisfied with my efforts, I use the sonic washer to clean the pan. I exit the kitchen and leave the homestead, starting to make my way back to the central building of the complex. So I jog down the street leading to the squire's canteen. The morning light peeks over the houses and the smell of dew and green life springs into my nose. It's so refreshing, so natural. Our moon might have been terraformed partially to accommodate the evacuees. There's always this missing element, this sort of organic feel. Apart from the gravitational compensators, you could ignore a lot about moon living. Being planet side again, I realised how artificial it really was. With all my thoughts focused on the induction yesterday, I'd completely missed it. I slow to a walk and take deep breaths. Last night's dream slips away from my mind as I look around and marvel at what the Lupine have done here. The world had been uninhabitable not that long ago. They have truly done wonders to expedite a process that would have taken millions of years naturally, if at all. Atmosphere, core stimulation, weather generation, they'd done it all. Then they waited as the flora and fauna they seeded, stabilised and acclimatised to a world made for them. Afterwards they finally settled down and built, ingraining all the buildings in the nature they had propagated. I have to admit, it worked. There is a nice aesthetic ambience, seeing the plants and flowers grown in every corner. Another squire passes me by and I rouse myself when admiring the view. I hurry after them. Using them as a guide, I follow them into the hall where the smell and dinner breakfast is in full swing. Long tables are filled with squires, most of them from the crop I'd seen the day prior. Older squires might eat later, or with their knights if they are allowed. A bank of machines lines a wall that has a small queue waiting. This appears to be what dispenses meals. The room is filled with a variety of smells that makes it strange and pungent, but not a pleasant aroma. I hurry to the back and study the dynamics that have already formed at the tables. A few clusters of folks look like they know each other well. They are possible friendships risen from pages having trained together on the same world. Others look chummy, though still polite as they talk. They likely met on the trip here and still try to keep up appearances. I fear I've missed out on this formative experience. There are a few that group together based on divisions, and others that mixed. For the most part, though, there's an excited and nervous energy about. I reach the front of the queue whilst musing, and I suddenly realise I don't know much about how these things operate. The person in front of me has yet to make up their mind, luckily. I see them slot their stick into the machine. It then displays a recommended meal for them. The reptilian sticks out their tongue with disdain and then swipes through the menus. They order a different meal entirely. After a satisfied flick, they retract their tongue. The machine, which I now recognise as an assembler, whirs to life with a pleasing series of lights. With a soft peel, a panel slides open to reveal a meal that looks very meaty. The squire bops away, happily salivating at his protein-rich offering. With a relative idea of what to do now, I step up and then slide my stick into the slot. It takes a moment for the assembler to register me. It calibrates and finally displays a meal. It consists of a heated cereal, much like what I prepared for Calvex, along with eggs and some sort of meat. It looks like more than enough. 
without much preference to go off of, I accept the recommendation and move away with the dispensed meal to hunt for a spot to sit as my stomach growls eagerly. Opting to choose an empty space on one end of a table, I dig in and find the meal just as, if not more, tasty than anything I had during my pages. The meat was spicy, leaving a residual heat to spread through me. A bite of the creamy cereal quenched it though, and was delicious. Should I have prepared more for Calvex? I should actually ask him what he prefers rather than guessing. Or I can ask some of the other squires what their nights eat and work around that. Uh, Brudin, why is your meal so appetising and everyone else is worth ignoring? I'm full of my thoughts by the bemused face of the man who I bumped into yesterday. Oh, right. He's in the cavalry retinue as well. What was his name again? I had tunnel visioned a fair bit during the whole process. Uh, Alexandrite, right? Um, I'm sorry. My head was spacewalking. Anything stellar? He looks down at me. I have to get used to the size of all the folks here. His tail alone looks as thick as my arm, though most of that volume could be fur. I had trouble getting a restful sleep. I decided to give up on that endeavour and come down to eat. I see the tip of his tail flick and twitch with annoyance. He was definitely skirting around something. Uh, may I join you? Oh, of course, please. I gesture to the bench. He nods for taking the seat, his movement so graceful and practised. You like working you hard already? I continue to eat whilst looking him over. He definitely is a looker, and his brow furrowing an attempt to hide his feelings is rather cute. Your knight was... Uh, um, the Ursine, right? The cannon? That uh, is right. You obviously should have been named Gatlin. He snores. Loudly. The cat looks abashed as if he's told some dark secret. Ahem. <clears throat> I will adjust, but it was uh, noticeable. I tried to stop my mouth from curling into a smile. Poorly. Instead, I hide my face behind my beverage before speaking again. It's not sound that bad. I have to admit, it's strange being thrust into duty so rapidly. Or well, there'd be some additional test or screening for we were assigned. His calm eyes lock onto me again. He studies me curiously. He's a little intimidating. I make sure to return the gaze. Uh, you didn't know? Well, it was a long process, the whole assignment of squires tonight. Test scores, temperament, potential. It's all evaluated and then paired with the best match. He looks thoughtful while he scratches his chin. His whiskers twitch. I know the knights themselves also have a say. Uh, considering our task, it would be a detriment to the whole operation to have two who don't mesh well. It makes sense. After all, squires are lifelines of the knights as they fly and fight against the plague. I guess I hadn't put that much thought into it. Why do you ask? Are you not pleased with your knight? Oh no, that's not it at all. My Calbex is a hero. I couldn't be more pleased by it. I just felt he deserved better. I mumble a little afterwards, and the cat's demeanour softens. I'd be comforted they would not put either at risk by making a mistake. They might find a reason to think it would work. Though I am surprised, given... Alexandra, Corwin, good morning to you both. With someone so loud, Zaria no sure knows how to pounce in from seemingly nowhere. We both jolt as the tigress slides into a space on the bench. I trust you both settled in well. Relaxing next to Alexandra, she gives us a nod before taking a deep swig from the canteen she's carrying. I don't see any other means of nourishment, so I guess her morning meal must lie within. Uh, just Alex is fine. We are fellow comrades, are we not? Alex raises an eyebrow in good humour and then glances at me as well. Same to you, Corwin. Alex is my preferred means of address. And Alex it is, and good morning, Zaria. I see you're in high spirits today. Zaria grins as she wipes away some of the faintly luminescent liquid from her lips after the drink. That I am. Just came back from a run. Cyrox is a machine. He lapped me twice around the habitats. Oh, a long way to go to beat his endurance. She bobs happily. Her energy is contagious, and I find myself grinning back as she chugs more for a meal. I'm guessing you're happy with your pairing, then? I couldn't be happier. He's strong and he has a gym in his home. You should see the gravitational weight setup he has. The resistance is incredible. I could have pumped all night. She suddenly stops her rambling and blushes. With a small cough, she composes herself. 
I mean, I am most pleased. I truly feel Cyrox and I are a good match. I'm excited to see how much I can learn from him. Alex gives me a sidelong look. He keeps his face fairly neutral, but his eyes contain a glint of mirth. Oh, we both heard how much you're looking forward to pumping with him all hours of the day and night. I did not say that. You... You... I am not against strangling a cat before noon, you know. She flexes her cybernetic arms threateningly. Alex raises his paws in mock defeat. And see, dear cousin, no need to be shy. We all know the kind of things that can occur between knights and squires. I don't think anyone would blame you. This time I joined Zari and squawked how Brazen Alex explained it. There was only tales of that kind of thing, and it wasn't frowned upon except it would impact team dynamics. Still, though... Zaria's whiskers thrash as she struggles to find words to respond. You... Cousin, indeed. I am not after court in my... or any other night. I am strictly wishing to serve our world that can be accomplished without any... extracurricular exercises. She chokes the remainder of her flask and then slams in on the table which causes the bear approachless, nervously, to jump about ten feet. Oh, uh, uh did, did I come from the bad time? I waved the bear over. I recall Zaria greeting him after me, and I suppose he spotted her and then gravitated this way. He shyly approaches and then sits next to me. I can smell something sweet as he does. His fur is slightly damp. Sorry, Gladius, I was just dealing with this irritant. She glares at Alex, who smiles as innocently as I can imagine back to her. She huffs frustratedly at him. Oh, I see you're all getting along. I hope you don't mind me sitting here. He looks my way, his button ears flattened. Damn, he's adorable. I need to reel it in a notch. The more the merrier. We're all going to be spending a lot of time together, so we might as well eat with each other too. Gladius smiles sweetly and nods a thanks to us all before he digs into his meal. It similarly has grains, but is topped by a fish with an alluring spice to it instead. Did you settle in well the other night? You were the dropship pilot, right? He gulps down a massive bite, almost choking on as he tries to answer me immediately. <coughs> <coughs> ah, sorry. <coughs> ah, I, uh, I'm with Night Captain Jeers. They are something, all right. Wouldn't let me go to sleep until I correctly identified all the tools in their workshop. He winces, but I see his ears wiggling happily. Maybe he's all right. They have a lot. They seem pleased I knew most of them. They showed me how to use the ones I didn't know and explained what he just used for. Some were custom made. It's actually pretty fascinating, but... I don't want to push him, so I keep eating and let him decide to finish his thought. Zaria, however, has no such restraint. But what? Showing being paired with the second in command is a great thing. It doesn't sound as thrilled as I'd imagined. Gladius winces again and scratches his head, getting the waft of sweet and damp fur. I look away. It's been a day. Get a grip. Ah, oh, well. I think my power would want me more in the action. I didn't message to tell him yet. He shrugs and looks at a bracery ways where I can see his stick sits. I've seen him before. It's a normal, if bespoke, means to carry one stick for easy access. Oh, you'll see plenty of action. You'll be supporting and protecting everyone. Oh, I don't think it's a bad placement at all. The bear looks up, alarmed, and twiddles his thumbs as he stutters. Uh, no, it's not that. I mean, I, I think it's pretty interesting to learn from them and all that. I just have a lot of expectations uh, to meet. Uh, my pa trained me for frontline combat. A lot. If he has an issue, he can feel more he wants. You should be proud you're in the cavalry, not moaning about what part you'll be playing, Gladius. The bear looks at me and smiles, despite looking worried. Are you... You can just call me Erex. Uh, Gladius is my inspire name. Cultural stuff. Dad, fighter, uh, you get it. I raise an eyebrow. I didn't know that about the Ursine system. So few passed through that I never got a chance to re-talk to one before. So you all have names of what your parents think you'll be? Yeah, sort of. Uh, when we come of age we get our Inspire name. It's supposed to be what we're called from then on as we pursue our passion. Parents have a say, yeah. Some more than others. But we also get to choose. Most of the end of the KAU get a weapon or tool name. 
My dad was pretty set for Gladius, and so... He smiles apologetically at me, though I don't know why. His self-esteem could use a good kick into gear. Him. The table all turns to Alex and he immediately looks away, embarrassed while continuing. It is not dissimilar to my own culture. My people use precious ores and stones as their naming convention. All kids on my world are born with the name Pebble. As we grow and achieve things, we earn higher standing names. Our leaders are named after the most precious jewels and minerals. They shine bright for all to see and follow. So you're named Alexandrite right now? But in the future you'll not be? He nods. Indeed, we often keep meaningful monikers for our personal lives. But our official nomenclature will ascend or descend, depending on the goals we reach in life. It's fascinating to hear about all these differences in their upbringings. I'd ask Alex what he wishes to be called next. That's when Zaria hollers and waves down the other end of the table. Hey, bro, come sit over here! I turn to see the wolf looking somewhat alarmed at her. I don't blame him. Her display drew a few looks and chuckles. He scans over the table and us. His eyes linger on me for maybe a fraction more than everyone else, unless I'm seeing things. He turns and walks out of the hall with his tray without a word. Even without speaking, I still find myself prickling about the attitude to that wolf. You think I should be more formal? I don't know. He does have the command for his knight. He may have other duties to go take care of. Zuri continues to watch the door he left through for a moment. Her lips pursed if holding back some choice words while she pivots back around to us. Maybe. Anyway, I'm going to run back, grab my stuff and have a quick wipe down. See you later, lads. She slides out and then leaps up with expert grace and power before jogging off. I marvel at her energy. We finish up our respective meals and then Alex leads us over to clear our trays. There's a machine that recycles any waste put in ne next to the assemblers. I think it looks like a baby bird with the way its parts close happily after each offering. Heading out, we join the throng of other squires. Circling the path around the building, we reach the main entrance that we entered yesterday after landing. I see the different divisions moving to other buildings to undergo their own specialised training. As we enter the hallways, the locator on my stick screen shows me the room to head to. Happily, Alex and Eric are in the same cluster. We end up together in a similar room to the one we were in before. The floor had been adjusted to a more spongy material. The opposite wall shows cabinets of weapons of various sizes and types. It's all so tantalisingly close to us. I look over them greedily. They're a far change from the rudimentary training tools we had access to as pages. These look well-worn, sturdy, and even lethal. I itch to pick one up. However, none of the others were, though they were looking as eager as I. With the exception perhaps of Eric, who looked nervous. A shame given he would be quite the imposing figure if he stood straight. The door opens again and Zaria bounds in with a look of eager joy. The collective share shudder at the thought of her pounding someone mercilessly in the sparring match. Root walks in as well, but my scoff dies in my throat as Commander Fenn marches in. Fall! Now! There's a hurried scrambling to all land up against the wall behind us. Fenn imposingly marches up and down the line a few times, his eyes darting over each of us. I can almost feel myself lose a few inches as the gaze passes over me before moving on. This room will be a temple for the foreseeable future. You'll train here, you'll sweat here, you'll bleed here. He strides about, clearly in full speech mode. His eyes keep drilling us, predatory, looking for any flinch or weakness. I force myself to keep still, only following him with my eyes. As I informed you all yesterday, the KAU may have determined your merit to be here, but that means kibble to me. You are nothing more than tools but used to end this insufferable siege. Some of you may become knights, may, but I will be damned if I let a single weak link break our formation. We are what separates systems and planets from complete harvest. We are the ones who initiate the majority of engagements in this quadrant, and we are the ones who take the losses. And I will not accept losing. He swivels to face all of us and snarls. I'm glad I'm not the only one to jump. I feel a pang of sympathy for the few squires who get a degree of spittle from his shout in their eyes. As far as I'm concerned, you are glorified medipacks. You keep us in the game so that the real fight can still be fought. 
That being said, you will be expected to fight. I will crush my ship straight through to whatever afterlife you believe in and kill your asses again if any of you die to foot soldiers. You will learn to shoot, fight and defend to the level that I expect. You'll hold the line and assist, but make no mistake that your main concern is to live. For us, for the Aegis. Behind him the floor recedes, then a structure rises up out of it. The ability to reshape and alter the room would have gotten my attention. The thing rising up is far more attention-grabbing. It has a mannequin-like body, with a glowing core and transparent amoeba-like membrane covering it. It's soft puttings it is faceless and amorphous. He taps the chest piece of the device with a single claw, and all our eyes stare at it. I've never actually seen an active one so close before. This is it. Our biggest purpose and privilege. I know you're all aware, but this tech was truly the turning point in our chances against the plague. We lost plenty of good soldiers beforehand, and trained was a mad dash to get spaceborne again. We all listen, enraptured, even as he shakes his head at the loss of so many. We've all lost someone, some much more than others. This link between knights and squires has become the cornerstone of our ability to keep fighting. You are what makes this work. Knights rely on squires to share the pain when we are bombarded, shot at, injured. You keep us alive. He gives us all a look I can only call contempt. Maybe distrust? So let's get this clear. This does not make you special. It makes you expendable. I'd rather burn through a hundred squires than make one knight remains flying. It takes years to get to the level required to fight the plague. If, and I do mean if, you all survive long enough to rise to those lofty ranks, then you will do it knowing the pain we all go through. There is a tangible feeling of unease and some sickened looks. Fen's attitude makes sense, but he's so callous about it, it's hard to stomach cure it so blatantly. The first thing you have to get used to is this primary duty. Fen heads over the left wall panel, which retracts as he approaches. Row of harnesses can be seen within. After taking one out, he swipes his stick at it. He then pointed towards the dummy that pulses in response. Right, who's first? His eyes shine with malicious glee as he surveys us like prey. He looks onto Eric's and raises an eyebrow, seeing how nervous he looks. Before he can zero in, Zaria steps forward. It'll be my honour, Commander. She beats her chest once. I'm not sure if she noticed Eric's or just generally wanted to be first. Fen stalks over to her and then hands her the harness. Very well, on with it. She puts the harness on. Once fastened, the loose straps tighten and just to her frame. After they finish, the piece in the centre pulses and glows. I assume that means it is activated. I watch, like the others, morbidly fascinated. We have had the tech on Foro. Instead, we use weak buzzers to simulate the Aegis during practice drills that became easy to ignore. Fenner retreated to the wall and comes back with a short baton. Well, it looks short in his large paws. He spins it effortlessly. It glows with a soft yellow light. Light-based weaponry. It made sense since he, hopefully, wasn't trying to do serious harm. Zaria stands opposite the dummy and looks expectantly at the commander. He gauges her for a moment. Then, with a burst of speed, he thrusts forward. The tip of the baton leaves a trail of light in its wake. Fenn's expression is steely and focused. There is a beauty to it. The motion of his jab is elongated by the trace and emphasises Fenn's form. At first, I think he's going to hit Zaria with it. He pivots at the last second and rams the baton deep into the transparent guts of the dummy. There's a moment when nothing happens. Maybe time slows down. I can see the impact of the bat inside of the membrane, a burst of light that ripples out, and the core flashes in response. As it does, the plate on Zaria lights up as well. Her first stands straight up as she spasms, her body instinctively trying to escape the pain. <coughs> the sound is ripped out of her. Her arms briefly pulse with an angry purple flickering out. She breathes deeply, flexing her arms like she's trying to work out a cramp. It's a very impactful display. There is more than all fidgeting as the rest of us realise only a matter of time by our own introduction to the device's capabilities. You handle that well, Squire Malrexus. Or back in line and pass the training gate to whichever your fellow squires you want to follow suit. Zaria turns back to us all, a very apologetic look on her face as she still calms her breaths down. The final inhale, she decouples the harness from herself, then passes it to Alex. He puts it on without a hint of protest and moves up in front. 
Fen proceeds to continue his induction of the squires without remorse. Squire after squire falls under his baton strikes delivered to the dummy, sending the shed portion from the aegis to them. Some bear it better than others, but everyone reacts. This is likely the first time many felt it, the amount of responses are making me nervous. The pool of remaining squires shrinks. Taking the plunge for being last would be best. I'd hate to faint over the only one unable to handle it. Eric's is up next. He takes the pain with a heavy grunt and a sniffle. He starts shaking as he turns to look over the last remaining squires. Me and... Fen's asshole of a squire. Luckily, Eric reads my pleading look and offers me the harness. His paws are shaking and he's panting as he does so. You... got this. His whisper is barely audible as he passes it to me. I get myself into it. The size difference between us is almost comical. I don't laugh. As the bands rapidly shrink from the bear's much broader frame to mine, I steal my nerves. Fen regards me, spinning the bat in a lazy half-circle, the same look he gave me the day prior. I'm not about to question it. I take my spot and stand to attention, waiting for the inevitable. The commander is far from accommodating. It's almost as if he's expecting my resolve to crumble. It's agonising. He draws at the moment, almost to my breaking point. He finally strikes. Even after all the others, his speed is shocking his explosiveness. His baton was already embedded in the dummy for I have time to register the attack, the glow on my chest activating a second after. My vision nearly wipes out. It feels like my body is on fire. The pain spreads out from my chest to every extremity, as if every single atom of my being has been personally attacked. <laughs> I scream. There's no embarrassment because others had, but my legs are buckling. My body recalls with the pain, all my willpower goes to try not to fall. I cannot force my knees to remain locked. They give in. I go down. Not hard, not entirely on the floor, but I'm on my knees. I use my right hand to brace myself from falling flat. The pain ricochets through me, waves more intense than I'd ever felt. I'm immediately sweating as the convulsions still pulse through me. I can feel the stares of the others. No one else fell. My face starts to heat up and I push myself to my feet. Hope to regain what remains of my dignity by standing in the tension, though I still tremble slightly. Fen is looking at me with a satisfied smirk. Was he wanting me to fall or would he have been satisfied with anyone going down? My mind is reading too much to rethink about it more. Hm, brute. I expect you to show me how it's done, considering who you represent. A squire waits me to take off the harness. My arms use her robotically. It's easier to stare at a brute stoic face than the others. I focus on him. It'd be attractive if he wasn't such an ass. He takes a harness and slings it on in a singular motion as I slink back to stand with the others. I avoid meeting anyone's gaze as I try to play it off as nothing. Right then. <laughs> Fen slams his weapon into the dummy with much more aggression. I think he could swing harder than he'd been doing. I still feel the burn of failure and pain buzzing in my head, but I swear he hit the dummy with more force. It also does not make me feel any better when Brute takes it with only the slightest shift and grunt. The best reaction by far. Fen gives Brute a nod of approval. I could just die now. Maybe I did, and this is how my body is dealing with my passing, by torturing me in my final moments. Well, there we have it. Some impressive resilience shown. Some less so. I shrink even more internally, trying to maintain my stance. I'm still twitching from the pain and feel even more heat on my neck. But it does not mean squat how well you took it now. Out there in action you'll be taking more. Worse. As much as we say we are the best pilots in the fleet, and we are, there is no certainty in warfare. We fly our best and do our best. If all goes well, that means we all come back home. As he's talking, the beaten dummy recedes into the floor, then the padded matting slides back into place. You, of course, will be expected to engage as well. Be it orbital or ground support, you will be fighting. You will endure when we are hit, while also staying safe. That is the choice you all made. I will suffer no delusions that this isn't the most intense faction of the fleet in terms of what we expect. He turns his back to us and walks to the weapons cabinet once more, returning with an additional bat on, he swings both of them lazily. To that end, now that you're all awake and warmed up, there's no better time to let me personally evaluate your fighting prowess. I'll say it again. 
It's not mean shit how amazing you think you are back in your cribs. Here, yeah? I only care about what I see myself. He brings the battens to a smooth stop and points each one out. One is aimed at Brute, and the other squarely at me. Since you two are the last to face the blows, it seems fair to let you be the first to spar. Use that fresh pain and adrenaline to give you us a good display, right? He cocks his head as he surveys the two of us, a smirk across his muzzle. I'm not certain he's targeting me, but I'm not sure why he would, beyond the fact that I'm the only human in the mix. I feel the need to prove myself. I tussle with plenty of partners larger than Brutus a page, if he does look exceptionally well built. I think I have a chance. With a grumble of hesitation, I stride forth and take the baton from the commander's right paw. His grip lingers a moment longer than it should. I stumble ungracefully as I take my position on the mat. Brute stands opposite me, his muzzle on that cocky sneer of his. I can't wait to wipe it off his face. I ignore that and concentrate firstly on the weapon in my hands. Although a baton was by no means an irregular tool we used as pages, they were far more rudimentary. I wanted to examine it fully. Sleek mat with the rivet that runs up the shaft. Has a nice heft to it. I feel a sliding switch along the handle. Small enough that my thumb could easily move it up or down. Each direction allows the device to switch modes. As you're all aware, our biggest and greatest means to damage the plague bastards is the light and heavy weapon systems. His utter hatred for the plague is clear from the way he speaks. Most of us rumble in agreement. To illustrate his point, he plucks the baton out from my hands and flicks the handle switch. The baton illuminates with that yellow glow again. He proceeds to make a flurry of attacks in the air next to me. I'd be lying if I said he wasn't impressive. Each jab is measured and flows to the next. This close I can feel the heat of him as he puts forth the display. Fast, agile, lighter. Using the inverse mass law, we can use light tech to accelerate our weapons and ballistics to the speed of light, or close to it. He comes to a finish after a few final jabs and then twirls the baton as he resets it. When he then he places it back in my hands. As he does, I can see how his huge paw dwarfs my hand. He moves off, circling around the outside of the padded area. You can move and strike exceptionally fast with light tech, but remember the faster you go, the less impact there will be. Less mass, less damage. Get a control of the situation to pin them down, but you'll want to use heavy hits for the kill. At this point he's looped around to Brute and takes his baton. When I face the baton this time, it hums and glows with the deep purple light. He starts swinging again, but the difference is noticeable. Even though he makes a flurry of attacks with the smoothness of practice and expertise, he's easier to follow. Heavy, or gravitational tech, increases the potential mass. That means each impact is heavier and deals far more damage. You can strike deep and hard, crushing or breaking apart armour or plating with ease. Land a blow with a heavy attack and they will be reeling, if not dead. He makes a few aggressive lunges and swings with it. The force behind it is evident and the control he exhibits in order to direct the movement is remarkable. Regrudgingly so. But it's slow and cumbersome. It takes strength and knowledge to land a hit. The bastards will certainly see any obvious attacks coming, so making it count is what matters most. He finishes his display and then tosses the activated baton back to Brute. The more you train, you'll find which side you lean towards when it comes to proficiency and accuracy. However, you'll be expected to, and you shall, be competent with both. Eventually, weaving and alternating between the two texts will be how you stop being a novice and inch towards becoming a proper squire. Not that that will come soon. So. He gestures to the both of us. As all eyes return to us, I feel his demonstrations help me calm back down. Even with the nerves of doing this in front of the others, I'm breathing normally now. Each of you choose a setting. The batons are capped on how much they can output, so use whichever you feel confident with. Show me something that makes you worthy of being here. Brew does not hesitate. He grins as his baton lights are purple and grunts as he lets the arm hold it hang by his side. And see his muscles strain to not drop it. He looks at me challengingly, mocking me to dare to do the same. I don't rise to the bait, instead activating my baton onto the soft yellow. I immediately feel how much lighter it is. Alarmingly so. Feels as if I'm holding nothing at all. The sensation is throwing me off. I slide the setting down a few ticks till the baton has a modicum of its previous weight again. Fruit smoke widens. I can see Commander Fenn standing off the side with the others. His arms are crossed and he watches with amusement. 
and were going to wipe all the smirks off their faces. I gave the baton a brief twirl, like fended. How's me get all familiar with the weight, or lack thereof, still in the tool? I crouch slightly and wait as Brute widens his stance as well. The other's eyes fade away as it all comes down to me and him. Begin! Brute dashes forward, much faster than I was expecting. He swings the baton overhead in an arc. He's compensating with the added weight with the centrifugal force. I manage to leap to the side in time, hearing and feeling the hum of it swinging past me. One clean hit from that and it's all over. So I deck and move around behind the wolf, I take a jab at his right side. The baton glides forward like it's the one need in my arm. Before I can register the motion, it connects. Bap. It was so quick that I'm still mid-thrust, striking with a few more quick, safe jabs. Bap, bap. They all connect, but he barely grunts. I dart back across the mat to create space between us, waiting for his next move. Brood looks after me as, as he snarls. He's not in pain, he's more annoyed at the fact that I hit him. The training weapons we had on Fora were just metal pipes of varying densities to simulate the feeling. In reality, it's so vastly different. I feel a bubble of anger at how underprepared I am. Ben was right. The light attacks are fast but dainty in comparison. I've only seen how much Brute can take from this type of assault. He'd hit something vital or hit harder. Brute doesn't give me much time to ponder my options, though, as he hungers low and twists his body around to advance on me with more intensity. Rah! Get attacking, this crazy wolf has me on the back pedal. Takes all my concentration to avoid his purple rod jabbing at me. Wait. Womp! Ha! The momentary distraction slows me and eclipses my left wrist. My blatant fires out of my hands, I tumble back and roll away. I scramble on my feet to prepare for a follow up blow. My arm throbs. There's no way I can hold the bat on properly now. My eyes quickly scan for my weapon. Brute stands between me and it, rolling his shoulder and grimacing as he moves his bat into his other hand. The weight is no doubt starting to wear on him. If I can get mine back, maybe I can find an opening. I want to shake up my arm. I'm fairly sure it's fractured or worse. I cradle it against my body to limit jostling it. Fuck, it hurts. My eyes water, I blink rapidly to clear them. Brute takes his chance to advance on me. I dive out of his wide swing and yell in pain, roam to the side and reach the baton. My fingers close around the handle. Crack! A sickening sound followed by a surge of pain erupts from my shoulder, travels down my body. The residual vibrations make my bones scream. Something's broken. I bite my lip hard to stop a full cry from coming out. Blood spills into my mouth as I puncture it, the taste coppery and bitter. I try to roll away again in case he strikes once more, but his foot blocks me. He stands over me, his baton rests on my shoulder almost lazily, even as he pants and looks down. Well, not bad. Certainly a good showcase of making the most of what you can do. Getting disarmed in battle is a death sentence, and you, Runt, are most certainly dead. I'm not sure which is worse, the pain or the humiliation. No, the pain. The pain is worse. Root offers me no paw, but I'd refuse him anyway. Neither arms are much use now. I'm not about to make this a complete day of failure, though. I grunt through the pain enough to push myself up. Hm. No sense having you cry in the corner and put everyone off their game. Go to the med bay, it's down the hall. Then hit the showers, no point in coming back afterwards. I wish a chasm would open up and swallow me whole, but I stand properly and give a sloppy, painful salute. Aye, Commander. I save the trickle of blood down my chin, but he doesn't address it. I turn and stride out the room as straight back as I can. All right, next step. You and you. Front and centre. The door closes right here more. I slump against the wall, tears spilling freely now. I made another shit show of myself in there. An embarrassment. Not only myself, but Calvex as well. Word will get out. Why well, get dismissed for being an obvious mistake? I dry heave. The taste of blood is replaced with bile as I throw up on the floor and wall. The only thing keeping me from collapsing is the knowledge I would not get back up again. What a fucking day. The wall beside me starts to slide apart, and I force myself out of it. The vacant space allows a small army of cleaning bots to spill out, so I'd attack in my offering with joyful tenacity. I seem I'm not the first to besmirch these hallways with their breakfast. The thought makes me feel a tiny bit better. I watch industrious machines for a moment longer. My shoulder and wrist soon start to insist we get a move on with fresh pulse of the pain. I push myself away and walk down the hall to the medbay to lick my wounds. Or maybe a cute nurse would. 
I wash my blood swirl down the drain as the water cascades over my head and drowns out my thoughts. The medical team was top-notch. They weren't surprised by my state, so they patched me up. The wrist wasn't an issue. My shoulder needed the better part of an hour. I still have a patch over the area. The gel-like product is doing its work on reducing the residual pain. My ego, though. That wound is deep and as therapeutic as the water feels. It doesn't wash away the chlorine feeling of defeat and humiliation that crashes over me in waves. I slap my hand on the panel angrily and take the glob of gel that spurts out and scrub my hair aggressively. Even through my rage cleaning, I hear the main door open. Chatter waltzes in the other squires, interrupting my sulking solitude. I slow down and try to appear more nonchalant. But even I don't buy the act. Here you are, Corwin. Are you all right? Zaria strides into the showers and then beside me, ignoring the squire as she passes. She's already new, but her arms give her the appearance of still wearing sleeves. Her eyes travel across my torso, to my shoulder, then look onto the patch. See, I told you, Alex, he broke something. I almost lost it when I heard the crack. I swear he's going for a break. Total asshole. Alex is further behind, so he's still stripping. Gives me a moment to look her over. Apart from the fact I don't see an ounce of fat, my heart deflates a little the fact she's not any injuries from her belt. Well, does she? I see her fur is matted on her neck. Was it a bit swollen? A lucky hit, maybe. She catches me staring and rubs the spot, wincing, and moving fully under a cascade herself. Yeah, I know. Collarbone got whacked. The Kokuta lad gave up using the baton when I pinned him down and started punching me instead. I guess I scared the fellow. <laughs> ow, ow. Well, at least you won. The words slip out of me before I can hold them back. Well, I think you did amazing. He was out for blood and you managed to dodge so fast I couldn't keep up. If I had been against him, I'd have been on the floor the second the match started. The bear chips in as he comes to take the spot on my other side. His lips and nose are all busted, but all in all he doesn't look too bad. They're the only injuries I could see. As if reading my mind, he scratches his face, embarrassed. Not that I fared better in my match. Alex is kind of a beast. He leans in to whisper. Doesn't make me feel a bit better. Though him leaning close to give me an eyeful of what other weaponry he had. Not that I was staring or anything. Well, not that much. Oh, I have the upper hand, Eric's. I've trained with that model of weapon before, and I've spent many sparring sessions using it. If he had chosen to sweep me in heavy configuration, I'd have been more cautious. The immaculate leopard joins us and basks in the shower adjacent to us. I'm not approved, but I do spot a glint from below that makes my eyes wander. I wish I'd seen it. I wish I'd seen all of you in action. Zaria Hartley slaps my back with a wet paw. Oh, you will. But I'll not promise I won't put you on your ass myself. I won't go that easy on you. If you treat him like a child, he'll die like one crying on the battlefield. There goes any small boy and head started to feel. The wolf stalks in and starts lathering up. Even the other stalls starting to feel he chooses some distance between us all. You are supposed to be the elite after all. Can't expect anyone to go easy on you. If they do, it's not a kindness. And yet you'd rather us all be killed off or crippled before we even get to the fight? Come off it, Wolf. We're supposed to be all in this together. She flicks water at him, but ignores her and just scoffs. Yeah, exactly. We have to have one another's backs. Expect me to trust some wimper bricks under a little pressure. Eric shrinks, as do I, that comment. Our gleaming tigerist, though, is still on the offensive. I trust him a fire a bit more than you right now, that's for sure, feral dog. Watch it, you armless pussy. He snarls back and starts to advance. His arm is snagged by Alex, who is looking at Brute's closed fist with a cool demeanour. Oh, what you got there, Brute? He squeezes the wolf's paw. Brute tries to yank it back, but struggles against Alex's grip. Brute finally wrenches himself free and then clutches his paw to his chest defensively. A bit uncouth of you to bring your stick to the showers, don't you think? Military hidden hollow vids are a little on the muzzle. If you had the stare after overhearing that, there's a murmur of discomfort. A few squires even cover themselves up with paws or towels. Brute looks around as expecting to be attacked, his ears flattened down. Don't get any fancy ideas. So I'll leave my stuff lying around to be snatched. You have a planet-sized ego if you think I'd be filming any of you fuckers. Backing up, still soapy, Brute retreats. He leaves the room after grabbing his clothes and towel, leaving a wet trail after him. The situation changed so fast I barely processed it. Hey, a corn. I blink then look over at him. 
Alex just flicks his ears free of some errant droplets and smiles. We don't always make the best first impressions, but hard work usually changes that. I think you have that kind of fortitude, so don't let this get you down. Yeah, yeah, I'll try, Alex. Thanks for that. I just don't like dicks. Given a glance around the showers where many nude squires were currently shown to its instruments, I turn back to face him and raise an eyebrow. He blushes profusely and practically dives back into the water spray. I uh, know, I meant... I didn't... Oh, go jump out of an airlock, human. I chuckle at that and he feels his join in. The tension breaks and my spirit is definitely a little confused, but lifted. The walk back to Carbex's place certainly drains my mood, though. The thought of having to face Carbex after my poor showing, or worse, having to tell him if he hadn't heard already, is making my stomach churn. My pace slows as I prolong facing him. I come to say after touting myself up so much, claim I want to be treated like a true squire, and proceeding to humiliate us both not a day later. Even a shuffle can't stop the inevitable. Sure enough, I'm at the porch of his home. I take a few breaths, trying to calm the flutter in my chest and stomach. What even happens to squires who are dismissed? They leave in disgrace or get put on the train duty until the war is over. I'd rather do that than let Maros see me. The hammer home my feelings of failure, the smell and sound of sizzling meat assaults me the second I open the door. My stomach doubles down on clenching, now with added hunger. My resolve is about to crumble. I start to slink towards the stairs when Calvex's voice calls out from the kitchen, stopping me dead in my tracks. Corn, oh, you're back. I'm away, you want to do more around the house, but my drills are wrapped up early. I can't escape now, so I make my way into the kitchen. My knight has made a protein-rich meal with... meat! I'm thrown from my pity party by the sight before me. My mind is so defined Calvex as a knight that I cannot comprehend the concept of a casual attire and... What a view. His relaxed look gave him a much more approachable feel. With his arms exposed, my eyes see parts where his fur hasn't fully grown over the scars. That doesn't detract from how built he is. Holy fuck. I must be drooling as Calvex cracks a smile when he sees me. Oh, don't you look that hungry? It's not much. Just what I craved after an intense day when I was a squire. His words bring me back down with a third. Yeah, an intense day, all right. My face must have soured because he looks at me worried. You're not against meat, are you? I didn't really check. I can make something else if you prefer. He looks so crestfallen I feel even worse. Uh, no, no, not at all. It smells incredible, sir. It's just... I take a deep breath. I... I... I fucked up. We had trained today the Aegis and then some sparring. I put on a shit show in. I fell and was beaten. I embarrassed myself, and worst of all, you. The words come gushing out of me. I'm horrified they don't stop as I start to shudder. I'm sorry, sir. I just want to show myself worthy of being here and being your squire instead, but I failed. Shit, I wanted to be this. I thought I could. Tears start falling me traitorously as I try to wipe them off nonchalantly with my elbow. Even as my voice cracks, I'm still shaking. Calvex is just staring at me. He hasn't moved, side from his ears which twitch and flick with each sniff and word. His eyes are locked on me, I feel even smaller. He must be furious. He places the balls on the counter and then walks towards me. God, the silence of his approval is killing me. Just yell, just punch me, spit at me, tell me how much I've dishonoured the uniform. As he stands in front of me, he's silent. I can't meet his eyes. I stare at the ground, waiting for... something... Anything. I'm pulled forward. A colossal paw on my head pushes me against his chest. His left paw pats my back, almost knocking the wind out of me. It's warm. I'm stunned. My brain cannot handle the distance between what I expect and this comforting feeling. How many years has it been since I've just held like this? I can't remember. I've been manhandled before in more primal ways. It simply held like this. He smells of pine and something earthy. There's a touch of sweat beneath the cologne. He'd also been working hard all day after all. Ah, uh, is that it? Well, we can't all leave the dog flying straight as an arrow. He's still patting me. 
I can still feel his grip. It's not firm. He hasn't forced me to stay. I can pull back, I can tell, but it's too nice. It hides my teary face, so I stay. None of us expect fresh squires to know everything to be hardened soldiers while they shred a weakness. It's why we train. Day one should not colour your entire career. His words are soothing, but part of me rejects them. I need to show them that I can do this. I'm not a liability. I'm not weak. I push myself away and squarely look up at him. You don't understand. I'm small, er, than the others. I don't have any evolutionary advantages, no enhanced senses to give me an edge. I can't let myself fall behind. I have to show that I'm worthy of you, that I can support you out there, that you can trust me, it's what I'm supposed to be. He gives me a sad gaze. Even his cybernetic eye matches his real one in expression. I think I'd rather have him be angry at me. This feeling of being pitied is unbearable. Well, maybe. Keep working hard and you will improve. All those years of the page will show through. Others will be better in some areas, but you will excel elsewhere, I'm sure. He sheepishly looks to the side as he continues. And if you're worried about the Aegis, don't be. I don't have any intention of you ever being linked to me in combat. Instantly, I feel like I've been smacked by Brute again. My stomach drops and I go cold. He never wants to link with me? You don't want me to link with you, but I'm... I splutter as he looks at me uncomfortable. He doesn't trust me. I know what he just said and then he slaps me with that. I feel like I have whiplash. My one purpose is to help you in battle. I'm not... You won't... Why? It's the whole reason I'm here. You just said I'll get better. I'll train. I'll practice taking blows. I'll... No. He looks angry. So am I, furball. I'm just a hindrance then. I'm just a weak human and a burden. Not good enough to even be used as fodder. Calvex flattens his ears and my voice hitches higher. I start yelling more. The feelings of inadequacy that have been building cascade around me. They're fueling my anger as he all my insecurities manifest before me. Well, fuck. Fuck, what am I even doing here? I work so hard now I can't even perform the basic duties. You cook and take care of yourself and so well you don't need me. Might as well be a pet for I'm worth. What point is there? I can't... Why? Fuck this, I can't... I turn around and flee the kitchen if I can fully break down. I can't do it in front of him again. A corn, wait. I don't. I take the stairs two at a time. I throw myself into my room. I slam the door behind me and then sink to the floor with my back against it. Great. Just acted like a child. What the fuck is wrong with me? Has this whole thing been a mistake? Why has it upset me so? Was my pride so fragile I could take no blows to it? Alone, I wallow in my misery. Calvex has not come to see me. Why would he? He rejected the core of our dynamic downstairs. Brute enters my thoughts with the shadow of Commander Fenn leering behind him. The two of them thoroughly prove to everyone how behind I am. Who could I even be mad at for that? You're right, after all. I'd been so proud of myself with all I'd achieved as a page, remember nothing in the face of everyone else. Who could I even blame? My backwater system with next to no resources, still recovering from the attack? Or maybe my instructors? Or the lack of anyone really serious about the same goals as me? At the end of the day... I only have myself to blame. I hug my knees tight to my chest, curling into a ball as my sobs devolve into sniffles. I feel pathetic. Usually I would be over with Maros, chatting and venting up, get over the latest step back. I don't want to message him. What could he even say that would help? He just said he should deal with the issue head on. Apparently it's my forte. So, I'm weak. I'm humiliated. My knight doesn't even want to let me help, and I made a scene in front of him. What do I do? Only one of these issues is an obvious course of action. I'm weak. I just happen to not be, and to concentrate on that and move forward. Look out the window and see the targets below. They're battered, littered with marks of constant use. How much had Calvex gone to after his recovery to make it back to active duty? Hours? Days? Weeks? No. Months, surely. Years, maybe. I was here after a single setback and let everything collapse around me. No, I can fix one thing, only for my own peace of mind. Train. Train more than anyone else. Catch up. Overtake. Prove them all wrong. Squeeze every extra minute of the day and put into improving. Win over the commander. Win over Calvex. Make them acknowledge me. Maybe apologise to Calvex at some point for flipping out. Maybe. 
Owen deals well past dusk to head out. Calbex went to bed early. I'm not sure if that's normal or if I made him feel bad. I creep down the stairs and slip out the door as quietly as I can. I thank the lupine engineer as the door glides open like a whisper. Though it is dark, there are a few street lamps lighting the way. The view of the stars above is spectacular. All forms of pollution, including light, not allowed on any engineered planets. Really is a sight, looking up into the sky and seeing the boundless beauty of the finite. I make the jog back towards the circular buildings in the distance, passing by some others doing the same. In addition, there's some squires doing nighttime routines, drills, there's some of us simply walking about. The dimly lit building greets me as I see a small flurry of drones soaring through the area, weaving and folding in on themselves like a murmuration of birds. They're oddly hypnotic to look at. Even the happy swarm of the various vegetation maintenance, I make my way inside. Retracing the route we'd taken earlier, I found my way to the room of my shame. I stare at the spot where my bile had painted the wall and floor. It's spotless now. Latent memory makes my nose wrinkle. Finger in the stick, I request access. I cite training as the reason the doors slide open. I'm shocked by the sounds coming from within. Peeking into the lit room, I see the lunge and earth form of Eric's, grunting with exertion. The smell of effort already permeates the room. Ah-ha! He swings a thick practice sword with large motions. His fur is dripping in sweat. He spots me standing indecisively in the doorway. Corn? He stumbles in an effort to turn his body to face me. In doing so, he ends up toppling over onto his rear with a heavy thump. I wince and then go over to offer a hand to pull him up. He takes it, embarrassed. Sorry, I was just, um, uh, how, how long are you watching me? He stands out with a squeak. A blush rises to his cheeks as he takes my hand. He heaves himself up to his feet, almost taking me off balance. Oh, like, a second. I just opened the door, you see, and, well, I was going to sneak in some extra practice, but then I saw you, and I expect to see anyone else, and I just froze. My rambling peters out. For a minute we both stand awkwardly. The only sound in the room is Eric's panting as he catches his breath. Oh, I was kind of uh, doing that too, <laughs> He chuckles. The blush still tints his face he avoids making eye contact. He didn't see it as you were, well, out, but my match was abysmal. My father would be upset if he'd seen it. Alex just moved so fast and gracefully. I'd have loved to see Alex's movements myself. I'm sure that taut body would be quite a sight to see in motion. I thought I should do some extra training. My family's always drilling me late into the evening, doing swings and stuff. Against an actual moving enemy, well... He shrugs and sniffs his breathing and starts to come back to normal. I won't lie, it kind of feels good to see I'm not the only one feeling dejected. Having said, Eric's is built so well. Even under his cuddle layer of padding, his body is jacked. If he feels behind, I'm leagues below that. I shake my head to clear my thoughts. No, no more wallowing. I, well, you saw me. I feel the same. And behind, Betty held it together and ended up getting killed by the enemy. I need to get better. I want to go through some steps myself. I find I'm lacking a lot of areas I thought I excelled at. Can't let ca- uh, my knight tore myself down. Eric solemnly nods. He does cock his head a little afterwards. I think he did all right, really. Brood is, well, he's something. But he still lasted longer than me and some others. I'm slow. It doesn't really matter if you have some strength if you can't even land a hit. He flexes his arms, but then deflates. His belly wobbles just enough to make my inner desire twitch. I subdue it. He looks at me bashfully and rings the hills of the sword in his grasp. Do you, uh, do you want to train with me for a bit? He squeaks again. He really is adorable. He makes me feel confident even though I'm still on the edge of being bummed. I'll be honest to train with the Eriks. Maybe we can go through some moves and stances. I don't recall ever seeing any earth sign drills. He looks, lovably, elated. He beams at me. Sure thing. I'm no expert. I can show you some stuff. And you can show me some of those rolls you did. They were really cool. It's my turn to blush as I nod, either get started in a forward direction. It takes a few hours, but we well and truly spent by the end of it. Eric's might not have the speed, but Boyd does he have the stamina and strength. He almost hit me a few times. After the first near miss, he apologised and worried I'd be hurt. And to make him not hold back, we both got in a real workout. Mostly it was me dodging the various blows and strikes he threw at me. Eric's style was not graceful at all. The sweeping blows were easily telegraphed, and even with a few mixed swings he threw in, I could predict everything by the end. 
It was hard, though. I could feel the power behind the swings, and knew one was all it would take to knock me down. That was out of even using heavy enhanced weaponry. Ha! <laughs> take this, then! And he smiles and takes another swipe. I can see the Ursine style was definitely designed with longevity in mind. It wears down opponents till they make a single mistake. His eyes are always trained on me, even as his body slowly moves to follow my newest dodge or feint. His eyes track me very well. It's almost unsettling. We both end up lying on the mat, panting. I'm not sure how much improvement we made, but it felt good to just physically exert oneself. A small feeling of accomplishment. I think... Yeah, I think I'm done. Me too. I could fall asleep right here. Well, I thought, yes, I mean, the night captain getting angry and jets in me at mid-exceed didn't chill me to the bones. I force myself to stand, even though my body protests. I hobble towards the door, followed by my bear in arms. We are siblings bound in mutual suffering. We make our way to the dimmed halls. We pass through other squires and personnel, but I recognise no one. By the time we exit the building to the nice cool air, we both have our breath back. We walk in comfortable silence towards the housing area for a while. Thank you. He blurts out as we reach an intersection. I jump with a sudden break from the quiet. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, what for, though? Well, for training with me and for not, you know, uh, laughing at me or anything. Why would I laugh at you, Eric? Fuck, man, I think you're a good fighter. I learned a lot from you. Thank you for letting me join in. He grins and scratches his neck. <laughs> yeah, well, any time, Corwin. It felt good to train with someone who didn't, well, slap me about for being slow. I wince and pad his side. He jolts but relaxes soon after. I'll happily train with you again. I need it, really. We chuckle a bit and Eric's points down a different junction. Yeah, thanks again. Um, well, I am this way. I'll catch you tomorrow, Corwin. Uh, thanks. Oh, sorry, I just said that. He's definitely blushing. Though I thank the dark because I am as well. He sure knows how to get me to grin. Sure thing, Eric. Sleep well. I wave him off and they head back to Calvex, his house. Maybe I can get a different type of workout with Eric if he keeps acting so cute. All he thoughts have to wait. I'm tired and aching. I sneak into the house and creep my way to my room. If Calvex was woken by me, he makes no move to come chastise me for being out without leave. I'm too exhausted to care. After stripping down to my pants, I practically fall into the bed. I'm glad to be done with this day. It may have been rough and my resolve is still shaky, but I've no other means of dealing with this feeling of inadequacy other than to try. When I fail at that, I'll try more. My eyes close, unbidden, they wiggle to a more comfortable position. I wonder, what would Mom say seeing me struggle? I miss her. The memory of her laugh is the last thing I think of as sleep takes me fully. There we go, that was chapter 2 of Infinite Space, or we come back to chapter 3 in uh, not too much time. Uh, we do have a, a Nick update from the smoke room that I need to do sometime. And uh, we have uh, two more Infinite Spaces to get caught up there, a couple more burrows, and of course maybe around three more liars to reach the end there. So I'm going to be uh, doing a few uh, videos and series a little more often just to try and get caught up with some of these uh, the ends, so I can then wait for another update. So there'll be a slight change in the way I've been scheduling things over the next couple of months or so, but we'll still be doing things here and there when they come out. Uh, I know Howley's working on Chemia, so there will be a new Chemia video sometime, whenever that comes out to the public, so we'll be doing that one. Of course, socially awkward when that's out, I'll be doing it as soon as I can. So you may see a little break, hopefully, and then too, not too many of your favourites are going to be waiting for a while. But I'm just trying to make it a little easier on myself with how I'm scheduling things. But I will be doing a Remember the Flowers next week, as that's been quite a while since uh, we did one of those. So I just want to drop in there before we uh, try to get caught up on a few things. There'll be some after years coming up as well as we uh, work on that one. So that is it for this episode. My voice is starting to give out. I'm still not quite over that uh, illness. But I want to say a big thank you to all my donors on Kofi and Patreon. You really help a lot. And my top patrons are Andy Peng, Samuto, Omar, Nova Starburn, Harvest Mouse Productions, Bieka, Marafu, Mario Cervantes, Makenya, Kartek, Copas Visser, Bastian, Brian Hall, Tiger Cup, Ida Corval, 
Dissonance, Grizz, Spiderling, Kopi, Cindy Dragowolf, Evan King, Exec, Aaron Fox, Mohammed Al Zamel. A quick extra mention to Bastion. He's the one behind in finite space. <laughs> so, well, as supporting the channel gives me more work to do here. But uh, it is, it's a. I will uh, try and do up some kind of schedule sometime, but we'll see how that goes. Even my patrons don't often see it because it keeps changing. But uh, there will be some Remember the Flowers next week, and I do have a few other things. We need to start the Elmach Chronicles, and we need to do a quick tennis race to get dropped back in there before we get back into that regularly. So there's a few things coming up. So I have to go and plan the schedule. While I'm doing that, go and support any of these VNs if you can. If not, just uh, track down a few other uh, the VN readers. There are many people doing this. And uh, we all like to have the viewers, so I can suggest you go and see a few people there. I'm not going to say anyone in particular, but I'm sure you'll find them easily. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.